Have you tried writing your own buffer overflow exploit, but without success? Have you tried doing the seed lab on buffer overflow, but you got stuck somewhere? Then this video is for you. Welcome to Frank's Diana Explains. I'm professor of security and privacy at the University of Cambridge, and I teach the second year undergraduate course on security. In my lecture on buffer overflow, which you can view in this video up there, I challenge you to write a buffer overflow exploit yourself within the framework of the seed labs created by Professor Kevin Durr. This video is an expanded version of that lecture, but instead of speaking to the camera, I sit at my computer and share my screen with you. So if you got stuck creating the exploit on your own, you can see exactly how I do it step by step. Of course, I won't solve the exact same exercise as in the seed lab, just a very similar one. So you can still go ahead and do the real exercise yourself afterwards, and hopefully then it will all work. Now you don't have to watch me mumble to my screen for a couple of hours. If you can complete the seed lab on your own, so much the better. And if you find that some part of what I do is too basic, it's okay to skip ahead. I've dropped some chapter markers to help. But I hope some of you will find something useful in here. I've reused snippets from this screencast in the actual lecture, but if something was too quick or too difficult to grasp there, then here you get to see the whole process step by step. Enjoy. All right, so I got a, a silly program for you here, um, which, um, what does it do? It basically flips a coin and uh, gives me a reward of either five pounds or 10 pounds, depending on whether the coin flipped was even or not. Uh, let's see that in action. So if I compile this, um, spill.c, uh, it says I shouldn't be using get that's a bad idea yeah because that's uh, something that doesn't check how long it is and uh, in fact that's exactly what uh, what you're going to do uh, use this dangerous function to to break this program uh, but anyway if we run this spill funny i can type the name spill uh, my name is frank okay and my sort code one two one two one two uh three four five six uh six five Congratulations, Frank. I'll send five pounds to that account. Okay, right. Let's see if I'm luckier next time. Um, still five pounds. Okay, too bad. Ah, oh, ten pounds. All right. Okay. Um, now what we see is that this program declares name, the buffer that holds my name, and the payee, another buffer that holds this other stuff about the banking details, um, and then the variable reward, which holds five or ten. And this variable uh, is not something that is input uh, in here from, from the user, but the two things that the user inputs are uh, buffers that we could overflow. And I wonder if I could write into this variable reward. I don't know if the compiler allocates these variables in order in memory, first name, then reward, then payee, in which case by making a longer name, I could write into reward, or maybe in reverse order, first payee, then reward, then name, then in that case, by writing a long payee, I could write into reward. Uh, I'd be curious to see if any of these things happen. So for example, if I run this again, it's a your name, uh, and my name is going to be a very long name, like this. And then my sort code, my account is going to be just a normal thing. Uh, and then, whoa, it says stack smashing detected, terminated. Okay, so uh, stack smashing. Stack smashing is exactly the kind of stuff that we're talking about today. Um, and this talks about having uh, overwritten some dangerous things like the return address. But actually here, I'm still only talking about spilling from one variable to another, which I can do while remaining within the same stack frame. So I wonder if I'm just less greedy than that. Can I, um, can I manage not to trigger this warning? So, uh, sorry, let me just say this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's as much real stuff as goes into this uh, name array because there's a terminating null after that. And anything I, I type past that should spill over. Let's see if it spills into reward. Let me just put a couple more numbers. Uh, sort code, I'll make a short one. Uh, and then it says, congratulations, this guy. Uh, I'll send, and, and that nothing has happened there. So let me make it slightly longer. So I'll copy this. Um, and I'll add uh, a couple more digits. Okay, so this one, fine. Uh, still nothing's happening. Let me make it slightly longer still. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, let me make this like that. Stack smashing detected. 
So this is getting a bit tedious. If I try an error like that. Stack smash and detect it still. Well, uh, whatever I'm doing, I'm either triggering the stack smashing or um, or not having any effect. Let's see if I instead uh, write into the other variable in case that's the one that would spill into the reward. So my name, um, I'm just going to write a short name, and my bank account, that's going to be a long one. And that also doesn't uh, do anything bad. Make it slightly longer. Ah, look, something happened there. Uh, congratulations. I, I was call, calling myself FFF. Instead, it's congratulations and nothing. So, uh, let's try this again with something slightly long. FFF. And here, I'll keep writing nines. This is where I got to last time. I write two more. And now I'm called 99. So, when I got here, I just hit uh, the terminating zero here. A hit here and this string was just terminated by the zero of that one and now anything else I put in here so the tail of this is going to be the name here so clearly we have payee followed by name and as I spill over from payee I write into name and the reward variable is not affected by either of them spilling over so it looks like first comes the reward variable then comes the payee and then comes the name in memory so uh, why don't we just have a look uh, if I if I recompile this thing, uh, how did I compile this? And I add some uh, debugging information to that, and then I run uh, JDB on this uh, spill. Then, and this is the listing of my program here, familiar stuff. Um, I'm going to stick a breakpoint here at 10. Uh, just over here, I, I just as I enter main, and so I run. And what do we see? Uh, that I have, um, oh, I don't see anything, but I'll ask it. Okay, so print me the address of, uh, my, my hypothesis is that first comes the reward at this address, then uh, print the address of uh, the next one, I think is going to be Peggy. Uh, and this was uh, E44C and this is E45, so it is true that this comes slightly later. And then uh, a bit after that, I, sh I expect to see this name. So print uh, the address of name, and indeed that comes after the address of payee. And this payee was 18 characters long. And if I um, if I take this uh, and I say this plus 18. Um, it gives me 462 uh, and 462 is a few bytes short of this 470 so um, there's some kind of gap between the end of this payee and the beginning of the name so if I if I try this again four, so 462 um, 462 470 minus 462. I shouldn't have had the 4 either. Uh, 462, right? That's 14 places. So there's 14 places in between those two which are somehow unused. Uh, and I could fill them up with garbage without uh, having any effect on name. And then from the 15th, I'm starting having an effect. Anyway. That, I, I'm just getting a bit sidetracked. I don't want to spend too much time on this. So um, what I want to do is to say uh, this um, this thing here that detects that I'm uh, spilling over and uh, smashing the stack, sm stack smashing detected, is a protection that's been inserted by the compiler. But I can turn it off to go back to the earlier times when these things did not exist. So 
if I recompile this with um, minus f no stack protector. All right, then I run the same program. And now, I can write lots of garbage. And instead of telling me that um, stack smashing detected, it just uh, spills over and gives me a segmentation fault. But if I look at what it did, this my name was DDDDD, and it's been overwritten by the 33333. And also, this time, the, uh, the reward has been changed to lots of million gazillions, probably more money than, um, than they even have in the bank. So uh, that's interesting because without that protection, instead of just um, stopping me from doing it, uh, the program still crashes, so uh, it's not great as, as an attack, but um, it does have the effect of overwriting the variables. So this tells me that in this configuration, without the uh, stack protector, uh, the layout of the variables in memory is different. Uh, obviously, this this one here uh, is um, is not before both of the buffers. Otherwise, it wouldn't be overwritten. And I could go in now again uh, with uh, my GDB and say, uh, what do I want to say? Break main and run into it okay and then I say uh, print the now I expect a reward not to be the lowest of these addresses okay 480c 450 and 470 uh, so the lowest is 450 then 470 and then 48c so either of these if they spit over, could uh, overwrite the reward actually. So I can I can make a regular length name and a super long bank account, and it will overwrite the reward. There we go. And I can do vice versa, and I can write a super long name and a short um, short payee, and that will also overwrite the reward. Uh, because it comes after both of the buffers. So there we go. We have established that uh, the the first one is the, um, the payee, and then comes the name, and then comes the reward, which is confirmed by here. Payee is the lowest address, and then the name, and then the reward. Okay. So um, these protections added by the compiler to uh, prevent stack smashing are things that we need to disable for our experimentation of recreating the buffer overflow attack because we we have to start uh, by understanding the basics and so we can't um, we can't start by defeating the countermeasures that have already been put in if we don't understand what the basic attack already was so we'll start by just uh, winding back the clock to a time when all these extra protections didn't exist uh, and we will we'll disable them one by one as necessary so one of them is this uh, stack protector that gets compiled into the program. Um, and uh, another protection that's present in modern systems is that um, basically every time you run the program, it kind of jumps around uh, and the address uh, of the various uh, variables um, changes. And we can disable that and go back to the time where uh, every time you restart the process, uh, it goes in the same place. And that is done by disabling a thing called uh, uh, address space layout randomization. There's a thing called system control. Um, so this uh, value being set to 2 means it's enabled, but if I um, set it to 0, then uh, this means it's disabled. And so I can I can demonstrate that uh, with it enabled, it keeps changing. So, for example, if I were to add um, print um, address of reward, address of name, which is a place where I might write my own things, uh, equals um, If 
if I add this thing here, then um, whenever I run this spill, I get some address. Okay, quit that. And it's uh, the same address because I disabled the specially app randomization. On the other hand, if I uh, turn it back on, then I run this build, then uh, look, it's a different address. And if I write again, it's a different address. And uh, write again, it's a different address. So uh, this is one protection that is also there that we are going to uh, get rid of by turning it off. Another one, as we said, uh, was during compilation, uh, we uh, removed this stack protector, which notices if you're overwriting the return address, uh, and also rearranges the variables to put the, um, uh, the buffers later. Uh, and there's another one that we're also going to disable, which is um, the protection that makes it uh, impossible to execute code that resides on the stack. And we're going to do exactly that, and so we're going to remove that protection, which we do uh, by another compiler option called Z exec stack. Okay, so if we compile the program like this, and uh, we disable the um, ASLR, then our system is as vulnerable as it was um, in the 1980s. So um, anyway, what we have just seen is strictly speaking, the buffer overflow from one variable to another, but it's not what people normally mean when they say buffer overflow, we, uh, people mean the stack smashing, where besides uh, corrupting data, you are actually executing uh, the attacker's code. Now, we weren't executing any code over here. Uh, and so how do we get to execute code just by feeding overlong uh, input into some of these buffers? Well, uh, stuff we've done so far is trivial in comparison. Uh, we have to understand a bit more about how the stack is arranged. Uh, and you did a bit of that in the object-oriented programming course last year. Uh, and you also need to understand a bit about assembly language, and we've done a bit of that in the introduction to computer architecture course early this year, even though it was for different process and not for x86, but never mind. So refresh your mind about the ideas from these previous courses, uh, and I'm going to uh, give you a quick recap. And there's, there's more if you need it in your wonderful textbook. If you don't need a recap, then feel free to use the chapter markers in the description to skip ahead. So I'm going to look at uh, our program again under the uh, debugger and uh, breakpoint in main and run. And what do we do? We disassemble main. And we get, this is the assembly language uh, corresponding to uh, the main function that we had written in C. Okay, and there's just uh, a bunch of very simple instructions which uh, push a uh, register on, on the machine stack move uh, some register into some other register, do the subtraction, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and basically, the processor goes from one instruction to the next until there is some kind of uh, change of flow control, such as this call, calling a subroutine, uh, or this uh, jump. In this case, it's a conditional jump, which means jump if the equal flag is set uh, as a result of the previous operation. Uh, otherwise, if it's not set, then keep going uh, here. And instead, this, this jump here is an unconditional jump, which just says jump here no matter what. Uh, so, um, if you have this type of operations, then uh, if you want to execute a piece of code that, uh, for example, computes a square root, okay, um, you compute a square root, and once you've done uh, computing the square root, what do you do? You want to go back to the place that called you. Uh, but you can't do it with a jump like this, because you would have to jump to a specific address, and you may have been called to compute the square root from various places in the program. Uh, and so you'd have to return to the various places that you were called from, which are different. And so you can't store uh, a jump address. You have to uh, keep track of who called you. And this is the difference between uh, calling a subroutine and jumping to another piece of code, because a call is paired with a return. And when you call, you push on a stack that is kept by the processor um, the address you want to get back to, which in this case is the address after the call. So this address here will be pushed on the stack when the call is executed. And inside the, call, inside the routine that is being called, at the end of that routine, there will be a return instruction. And that return instruction has the effect of popping, popping from the stack uh, the topmost address and sticking that into the uh, um, instruction pointer so that we resume execution from here. 
So this uh, stack of return addresses essentially is supported at the processor level, and so there are machine level instructions like command return which operate on this stack. If we are dealing with a higher level language, which has uh, not just subroutines which do stuff, but subroutines uh, functions that uh, take in parameters and have local variables and so on and so on, then all that stuff, uh, the parameters of the routine and the local variables of the routine has to live on the stack as well. You cannot put them in some static place in memory because uh, otherwise if you invoke the function recursively then you would overwrite it. So, so uh, what is actually pushed on the stack besides the return address is a whole uh, so-called stack frame that contains all these things, the function parameters and um, local variables of the function. And also in fact a reference to uh, the previous frame uh, in the stack. So the stack, stack, let me draw something here. This, this is a representation of memory. Okay, this is high addresses. This is low addresses. So memory grows this way. Okay, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, like that. Uh, I say this, although it sounds like the most trivial of things, because when you actually look at something uh, in a listing produced, for example, by this, uh, uh, this assembler, then um, the numbers go the other way. So this is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 going downwards. Whereas here in this, this type of diagram, we have uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 going upwards. Uh, if you print, because you print down the page, then clearly the earlier things, the, uh, the lower addresses are at the top. And then as you go down uh, at the bottom, you get the highest address. Whereas here, uh, high is where high suggests, uh, which is at the top. So the stack is made of stack frames. I mean, the stack is made of, by pushing individual words, but if we take the view of the high level language, then uh, the stack is filled up with the stack frames, which are made of many words, like this stack frame for the next function that gets called. And if this function here calls another function, then this function will come up with its own stack frame. And if we look at things uh, in great detail, then what happens is this, that first of all, if I enter a function, um, let me just bring up something that has it. This, this, this program here has only main. So let me take on something that uh, has more functions. I made myself uh, nested, nested routines here. So this is a program that doesn't have any point other than uh, having routines that call each other. So that's this main, which has a local variable and it calls function f1. And this function f1 has parameters and has local variables and it calls function f2 and f3. And this function f2 and this one doesn't have local variables, uh, it does have parameters and blah, 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 like that. Okay, so what would the stack look like? So I, I start the program and uh, so main, main runs and it will have its own stack frame pushed on the stack. And then uh, as main invokes this f1 function over here, then this f1 function will have its own stack frame over here. And as uh, f1 calls f2, then the f2 function will come over here. So as main f1 f2 and then uh, f2 in here uh, calls f3 and so uh, there would be uh, f3 uh, called in here and how does it work well when uh, this function f2 calls f3 then there's going to be some some kind of call like this uh, and before that happens uh, call is uh, you know transfer the, the flow of control of the machine code from this thread to over here this other address um, before that happens, I have to push the parameters of F3, which are these uh, A and B that it takes. And I push them in reverse order so that uh, they appear in memory in the order that they are. So I'll push, I'll push this, this B first. So uh, B. Then I will push this A. And then having done that, uh, I will uh, call and calling will push the instruction pointer, a register of instruction pointer will be pushed by implicitly by the call function. Now, as soon as I get inside the routine, uh, the first thing the routine will do will save the frame pointer. Now, what's the frame pointer? Uh, let's just save it and we'll see. Uh, so this is the, uh, it's called frame pointer or base pointer. Uh, when I, want to refer to things on the stack, I have to say, uh, I don't have variable names in, in assembly language, so I have to refer to these various things, you know, the parameters here, 
And then the next thing I'm going to do is uh, the local variables. Now this uh, F3 here doesn't have any local variables, so I'm not going to do anything. And so that's the end of my stack frame, stack frame for F3. However, if it had had any local variables, they, they would have been uh, here below this base point. So how do I refer to various things? I refer to them uh, with reference to something fixed. And you could say, well, why don't you just uh, say with reference to the bottom of the stack frame, uh, the bottom of this stack frame? Well, because once I am inside this function, uh, nothing stops my F3 in here, in principle, from, uh, for example, doing, you know, pushing some words on the stack by itself. Uh, it could very well, you know, I have the number 35, I want to remember it for later, and I'll push 35. And then I might pop for 35 once, once I need it again. And so this would move the stack pointer here. Stack pointer would move here. Well, let me just um, have a stack pointer in another color that I can then uh, actually move. So this is the stack pointer. Uh, and if I push uh, some other uh, number from the routine F3, for example, uh, 42, then the stack pointer moves to here. And then when I pop, let's say I pop something into a register, then uh, this would go here as, um, as this 42 gets uh, removed from the stack. And if I pop another thing from the stack, then uh, the stack pointer moves uh, back here. But the point I'm trying to make is that I cannot say, you know, I am uh, three up from the stack pointer to identify an item in the stack frame because the stack, stack pointer keeps moving while I am inside my routine. So I need something that can be a fixed anchor and that is the uh, frame pointer. So every stack frame has something which is taken as kind of the origin and that's the place where the, the word where I store the previous frame pointer. So there's going to be something here which was the frame pointer of this, the frame pointer of that, the frame pointer of that. and Above it, you have the parameters of the routine, and below it, you have the local variables of the routine. Parameters, local variables, parameters, local variables. So the parameters are identified by positive offsets from the frame pointer, and the local variables by negative offsets from the frame pointer. Uh, but you can, in, within the routine, you can move the stack, uh, you, you can push, uh, push and pop uh, things on the stack, and therefore move your stack pointer, but you're not going to move the frame pointer. So, sorry. Uh, and so this means it's still a valid reference for uh, talking about the other things. And what you're storing here is the previous frame pointer. So this, this is basically saying uh, the address of this. And this is saying the address of this. And this is saying the address of this and so on. Uh, so that when you, um, when you pop off the high level stack frame from the stack, then you can get back to um, restoring the register with a base pointer uh, to something that is the correct place for the previous stack frame. Okay, so that was a um, somewhat uh, long-winded detour, but something that we need to be familiar with when we uh, are doing the uh, buffer overflow attack for executing our own code. If we wanted to look at this in practice, we could just uh, compile this um, We could compile instead of spin. We could compile um, what's it called? Nested routines. Let's see. And we would get um, okay. I could stick a breakpoint once I get into F3, so for example at line 4, uh, a breakpoint in, I could say in F3, uh, line 3, all right, and um, I run, I mean, let's stick another breakpoint in uh, F2, I run, uh, and I got to the stage where I'm in F2, and I say uh, backtrace, uh, I'm inside F2, that was called from F1, that was called from main, that was called from ellipse, start main, and so on. So this is the situation we have here. Um, so main, main uh, has called F1, it's called F1, which has called F2, and I'm inside here. And so now if I look at my uh, base pointer, the base pointer is this uh, FFFFF 
E450. And this E450 points um, at E470. So the content of E450 in here, this, this is the base pointer while I am inside F2. Uh, have I actually gotten to F2? Let me just do one more statement. Uh, no, I, I wasn't inside F2 yet. So now I mean, I mean the code line 9. Uh, the int G is this line here. Um, 9, 9. Um, I am genuinely inside F2 and my base pointer is uh, E418, which would be the uh, base pointer points at this. So, uh, base pointer register. This is called R base pointer because it's 64 bit. The um, 32 bit would be called E base pointer. The 16 bit would be just called base pointer. Anyway. Um, so this base pointer register uh, currently points here and inside here, sorry, and inside inside uh, this word uh, is the value uh, 450, which you can see is a bigger number, uh, 18 and 5050 five is the bigger number, which means it's higher up towards higher addresses because it is the number that's written in here is uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, 450. The address of here is 418. So the address of here is 450. And the content inside 450 is this 470, uh, 470, which is actually the address of this 470. And blah blah blah. So uh, above this place uh, 418, we expect to find the parameters of F2. Uh, which would be these things in here, and below it we would find the, um, the local variables of F2, which would be the um, this S. Now, actually, uh, I have been describing um, the convention for the 32-bit, 32-bit um, program. This is 64-bit, so it works slightly differently in terms of the convention for passing things around the 64-bit processor has plenty more registers and therefore it uh, uses a convention that makes things faster because it doesn't push parameters on the stack unless it needs to. So if you have um, sufficiently few parameters and less than half a dozen parameters then you can just pass them in registers because you have plenty of registers and then everything stays in the processor and goes like the wind. If you have plenty of parameters then you start dumping them on on the stack and then this takes uh, a bit longer uh, whereas the 32-bit um, calling convention is always to push the parameters on the stack however few uh, you have so if we um, recompile this with 32-bit um, like this and we rerun the debugger then you see you, you, these, these are um, the 64-bit addresses and you will see that the addresses here are going to be a lot smaller so break uh, F2, breakpoint, uh, run. And you see these are all uh, eight, uh, eight character addresses, which means four byte addresses, which means uh, a word of 32 bits. And so here the, the registers are called E instead of R, a 32 bit. Is the, uh, that's the name of the registers in here. So the uh, E base pointer extended, base pointer extended from when it was 16 bits. Is this so 62C would be um, if we go inside uh, 62C is now be pointed to by this one because we are now inside the F2 so these blue things are no longer right. I'll use another color for doing what we have. I'll use what other color have I got? It's white. Okay, so now in F2, we are inside the function F2, uh, our base pointer is 604, so this is address 604, and it contains uh, 62C, 62C, which is the address of this, 62C, which is bigger than 604, and then this contains 658, 658, which is the address of this, 658. 
which contains zero because it's main we started from main okay so um, if we were to look at this uh, stack now the stack pointer at the moment is here uh, phi e4 which is lower than the stack pointer would be here and this address is phi e4 okay so let's have a look at this stuff Try before uh, examining the memory. Um, let's say, I don't know, 30 words uh, in hex starting from um, the stack pointer was fffff d5 e4. Let's align with, with the zero just to preserve our sanity. fffff d5 e0. And so what we see, and remember that this is upside down because these are the low, lower addresses, and as we go, as we progress, then these become the higher addresses. And um, also there's the added complication of the words. Uh, are, so this is a word which is made of four bytes, but in memory, they are little endian. So uh, even though this is the most significant byte of the four bytes we have, the first byte to appear in memory at this address, blah, 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 5 e 0 is this one, f7, and at 5e1, there will be this other byte, 6, 1, and then at e2, there will be uh, this other byte, uh, 5, 5, and so on. So this looks like it's the first, but actually this is the first, second, third, and fourth, or I should even say this is the zeroth, first, second, and third, and then this is the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, and so on. Anyway, uh, we were looking at the stack pointer, which points at uh, 5e4, so this is 0, this is 4, 8 and C. So uh, this is the first word of our stack frame over here. First word of our stack frame. What have we got in this stack frame? Well, uh, we expect in the stack frame for F2, we expect to have uh, two local variables, S and G. So we might as well say, where are they? S, uh, print me the address of S. That's uh, D5, E9. D5 E9, uh, D5 E0, so that's E0, that's 4, that's 8, uh, so that's 8 and 9 is over here. Uh, so this, uh, not this initial byte, but the next one is, E9, that's very strange, why is it not aligned? Uh, oh, because it's, uh, 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 it's the buffer that comes first. And it's, a, it's not a, um, an integral number of words, because 23 is not divisible by 4 anyway. So it starts there, and then it extends for 23 bytes. And then the other thing was G. Um, so, and this G is instead of 600, so it's over here, uh, which suggests that uh, it could be overwritten if this uh, buffer were to overflow. But anyway int g equals c times d. So if we execute this instruction, we should see something happening at g, which is here. We should see this. Uh, c times d. Uh, by the way, what are c and d? c and d are two of the parameters of this routine. So this routine, um, as we can see uh, over here, we're in F2. So these things that we just found were uh, so s at 5e9, 5e9 is s, it's some kind of buffer, and then we have um, at 600, we have this uh, g, what is it called, g, which is just uh, four bytes, so it's, it's one word, obviously it's an integer, just one word, uh, and just after that we expect this 604, that's the, uh, the previous frame pointer, so 604, this one, fffff d 62 c is this base pointer at 604, which contains d 62 c It all uh, comes back together. And then above that, uh, the thing that's just above this, if you remember how we were building these stack frames, would be the return address. So the return address from uh, F2 is the place in F1 that called it. So F1 calls F2 over here. And at some point in here, in the machine code expansion of this uh, arithmetic expression, I have to get back after I have computed F2. So if I look at the backtrace here, then I should find uh, this address here, which is the return address. I should find it 
as part of my uh, F1. So, um, and indeed, look at that. This is the return address, return address, return to this place in F1, which was computing uh, some arithmetic expression array. So once I finish with that, I go back to this place inside F1. Very good. What do I expect above that? I expect to have the parameters that were given to me. And as I said, I push the parameters in reverse order. So first I push E, then D, then C, uh, so that, uh, and here we have this uh, C, D, E, uh, uh, 7, 8, and F. And I push this one first so that it's the highest so they would have been pushed like this. Uh, what is it? E, D, and C. And so the E is F, D is A, and C is 7. And I should find them in order as I go, as I go through in this direction. And I should find, okay, uh, first my return address and then C, D, and E. And C was supposed to be 7. And indeed, after this, I find 7. And after that, there's an 8. And indeed, the next word is. 8 over here. The next one is f, and indeed it is f, and that is the end of my stack frame. And so the next thing is the beginning of the stack frame for um, f1, which we would unravel after returning from, from f2. But I think you've had enough uh, of all this. So uh, the thing that we are interested in is, of course, that uh, these various local variables so whenever local variable here is a buffer that I can uh, spill over from, then anything that is higher than that in memory is something that I could be writing over. So I'm, if I can, if there's a buffer overflow vulnerability that affects this variable s, then anything after s uh, is something I, as the attacker, can potentially overwrite. I cannot write anything below s. If there were any variables below, below here, I couldn't touch them. But this one, I can rewrite this variable, I can rewrite frame pointer. Crucially, I can rewrite the return address that uh, changes the flow of control when I return from F2. If I've written another value in there, I will go there. And that's the core of the buffer overflow attack. And I can still rewrite all these other things and all this other stuff. Now, nothing really matters uh, anywhere near as much as rewriting the return address, because that is the thing that uh, lets me take control of the flow of execution and run my own code. So the story is, okay, I will put my own malicious data into this buffer, which will spill over this buffer, will overwrite this code with an address that will send me somewhere in the other things that I, so my, my input, if I, if I make my input uh, some other color, such as, uh, what color I want to use, okay, purple. So my my stuff is gonna be like this. We're gonna come in here. I'm just gonna take up to here, for example. And then I'm going to have some uh, some machine code doing devious things. For example, here, or for example, here, important thing is that machine code should not be uh, overwriting this part, which is the return address. In the return address, I do point, I, I do put uh, a pointer to either here or here. Um, I guess the difference is that this part is bounded in size by the distance between the buffer and the return address, whereas this part, I could make it grow arbitrarily long. Uh, provided there isn't a limit to how big my input can be, uh, then I can I can put more stuff in here. Uh, and uh, yeah, I jump into the place where I put my, my code, and I usually I don't need to make it very big because the code that does the stuff can be very small. Uh, and once I have a foothold in there, I don't have to put uh, all, all the bad things uh, in here. I can just start doing bad things after I got control from my... For example, if, if my code uh, gives me a shell, then once I get a shell, I can just do whatever I want without having to write it in advance in my uh, malicious payload over here. But anyway, so we've seen uh, what the stack looks like and we've seen where we're going to do damage. Uh, the thing, uh, maybe the most important thing to remember is that you have uh, the thing pointed to by the base pointer. Uh, the word above that is the return address, the thing you want to overwrite. Uh, above that, you have the parameters of the function, and below that you have the local variables of the function, which is the place which may contain a buffer that you can overflow, and then if you overflow it, then you're going up in memory to overwrite all the stuff. So let's finally get to the stage where we do um, create an attack, and we are going to attack this initial uh, challenge program. Um, 
over here, which we are going to uh, recompile in the same way that we've compiled this. Shall see. Um, We do, okay, so this uh, minus g is the uh, add the debugging information, m32 is 32 bit, uh, no stack protector, uh, make the stack executable, and then call the uh, output uh, child and uh, compile the file child c. Okay, we compile that. Um, and what this does, um, what does it do? Uh, it opens a file, bad file, which is supposed to be the input from the DDoS attacker, input from from the user who happens to be bad, uh, and then uh, you read this file that you just opened, uh, you read uh, up to 600 bytes from it into the string str, which is dimension to 600, so it looks like uh, this is a, a well-checked thing, there's no chance of a buffer overflow, but then I, I run another function which is called buff to suggest buffer overflow, and this buffer overflow instead has a buffer of only 100 bytes into which it copies this string, which uh, could potentially be up to 600 bytes. So if the bad file is uh, less than 100 bytes, then everything's fine. If it's more, then uh, there's going to be a buffer overflow in here. And we want to exploit that to, uh, um, to do privilege escalation, because we assume that this program here has been um, has some privileges. Okay, It doesn't really deserve them, but we are going to give it some privileges. This is a suggestion I, I gave when I said the challenge. So I uh, sudo so uh, on root chal and I sudo chmod uh, set your debit chal. There we go. And so something no ah shit because this is in a shared folder then uh, it doesn't let me set this uh, bits and sets uh, weird permissions because uh, of the shared folder. So I need to move this somewhere else. Uh, never mind. Okay. So um, playground. Um, Okay, and now um, let's read those things. Compile this and um, chew on root and um, that's more like it. Okay, so now this is a uh, set your root. Okay, group Frank Stein explains. Okay, so now we have this setid root program. We want to exploit the buffer overflow vulnerability to get a root shell. All right, so to get a root shell, I need to basically write some machine code that will give me a root shell. And uh, we're not going to go into how to do that. We are not, not that interested in, in the payload. We are interested in the attack vector. So if you, if you can make the attack vector execute your code, then in the payload, you can put anything you like. Once you, once you get a shell, uh, a root shell, you can do anything. You, you, you can put um, any other kind of payload. The, the demonstration uh, that I think I had in the handout is just you know, print, print today's date with the bin date program. Uh, just whatever you, you put in. So here uh, I, I got some. Um, Payload shell. Let's copy this here. This is just some bytes of machine code that, trust me, if you execute this, then you will get a shell. And if you're if you're executing this uh, from a program that has root privileges, then this shell will be a root shell. Except uh, that uh, a number of shells that are uh, common in in Linux that are default in Ubuntu uh, have another countermeasure whereby 
if they see that they are being executed under set UID, so if the effective user ID and the real user ID are different, then they drop privileges, just to avoid that type of stuff. So another uh, countermeasure we're going to disable is this one, and we do that by um, making uh, being sure a symbolic link to another shell. So what is it now? Uh, being sure at the moment is dash, which has this countermeasure. So if you if you if you are uh, running dash in a set UID context, it will drop privileges. So if you are root and you run dash, of course it will be root. If you are someone else who's uh, running with elevated privileges, then dash will drop the privileges if you run it from there. So what we do is uh, link uh, symbolic uh, and override the link uh, being the shell. The Z shell doesn't have this protection. Being shell. Ah, sudo. Okay, so now, now we're linking to Z shell, which doesn't have the protection. And so if we do things properly and we execute this machine code from uh, within our buffer overflow attack, then we will get a shell and it will be a root shell. Good. So um, what we need to do, let's recap. Uh, we have, let's make a blank page. Uh, we have a stack frame of our function buff. Stack frame of buff. And this consists of um, parameters. Okay, so the, we will push this str. Uh, that's going to be a word in there. Uh, then there's going to be the return address. Then there's going to be the previous base pointer. And then it's going to be the local variables of this, which is basically this buffer. of length 100. And so uh, I am writing into here, my my malicious code goes into here, my malicious data, which in fact contains code, goes into here and can overwrite, can go beyond that. And the important part is uh, here. So if this is the beginning of my buffer, and I, and I don't know for sure that this is actually the beginning of the stack frame, so I shouldn't make the the drawing uh, suggests that because I don't know and I don't actually care uh, whether the two are the same. Let's say the buffer begins here. I don't know if there, there's extra garbage in there. I, I really don't care. What, what I do care about is how far from the beginning of the buffer is this return address. What is this distance? Because that's where I need to put in my input uh, that, that relative position. Let's say that this is, I don't know, uh, 100 and and 8 bytes, for example, uh, or 128 bytes, or 112 bytes. I don't know, uh, whatever it is, because I don't know if there's any gaps in between those things, uh, I need to put my overwriting thing that says where to jump to exactly in that position. So I need to figure this one out. Another thing I need to figure out is, okay, I'm going to put my own code somewhere. I, I could stick it here because it's, it's pretty small. I mean, you, you saw it here. It's a... Uh, it's less than 30 bytes. So I can certainly stick it in the 100 byte buffer. So let's say that I put it here. This is my payload. Then I have to write, the, the thing I have to write in here is where to jump to. So the first byte of this, um, of this payload. How do I know the address? I need to know where this buffer begins. And, and I have no clue. So what am I going to do? I am going to cheat. Let me cheat. Okay, I'm going to cheat by, uh, for example, looking uh, under the debugger. And so if I say uh, GDB, GDB, what was it called? Uh, child, right? Now, um, breakpoint in both and run and uh, seg b. Oh, 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 seg b because uh, this I this comes from the seed lab but I've removed um, as much as possible to make it as short as possible so uh, there used to be some checking that um, the bad file at least existed because otherwise I can't open it and so uh, it doesn't exist and so this crashes because of that so 
let me just uh, touch a bad file and now there's uh, there's a bad file of length zero and uh, I can now run this uh, breaking off and uh, run and now it doesn't crash and now I'm inside both and uh, go into both The next instruction is going to be the strict copy that's uh, going to uh, take stuff in, but uh, it's not going to be dangerous because my my bad file was only zero bytes long. But anyway, at this stage, I can inspect what I have. Uh, where is the uh, buffer? Buffer is at uh, fffff d three nine c. Let me just uh, copy that into my scratch scratch space over here. Uh, that's useful because it tells me tells me this. It tells me uh, the address I have to put in here so that it sends the um, the processor uh, over there to execute my payload. All right, now where is that? Where is that? Well, uh, when I'm in here, when I'm inside my buff, and I am inside buff now, I'm, I'm about to execute this instruction of buff, then uh, what does the stack look like? Well, uh, the stack pointer is here at uh, fffd390. All right, let's have a look at the stack. Uh, Thirty words in hex, starting from the stack pointer. Right. So, uh, what have I got? At uh, uh, stack pointer 390 is here. I must have my buffer, which begins at 39C, three, so it's 390, 394, 398, 39C. So that's the first word of my buffer, which is then 100 bytes long. 100 is uh, divided by 4 is 25 words, so it's 1, and then 24 is 4, uh, 6 times 4, 24. So I got this, and then uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So all this is my buffer. And after that, I expect to find, uh, well, the previous base pointer, I didn't know if there was a gap in here or not, but the previous base pointer is certainly pointed to by the base pointer. So the base pointer points at uh, 408. So this means that these two extra words are not part of, um, well, are some, some kind of um, extra padding. I don't know why it's there. But uh, this place here is where I would see uh, the previous base pointer. So uh, let's print out more stuff. Uh, where were we? Um, the base pointer 408, uh, so 4, 400, 404, 408. This is the previous base pointer, which contains 688. Uh, indeed, it does. Okay. And then the next thing, that's the thing I want to overwrite. That's the thing where it's going to return. Uh, if I do a backtrace, then I see that uh, this was called by main at uh, 56556284, which is exactly this, that's where it wants to return. And instead of letting it return to main, I'm going to make it go uh, to the place I wanted, which was the beginning of the buffer over here, where I'm going to put my devious code. So I believe I am all set, because now what I do is I just take the offset between here and the start of the buffer, which was over there. So um, this EBP, uh, where was it? It's scrolled up, up the screen. I can say, okay, print me the... Uh, EBP, that was uh, 408, okay, and so I can say 408 minus um, the beginning of the buffer, which was here, so go there, so I just say um, 408, 408 minus the beginning, which was uh, 39C, That's the distance between the bottom, the beginning of my buffer and uh, the previous base pointer. Then I have to add four, one more word to get to the return address. So this plus four gives me 112. Look at that, 112. Um, I, I almost guessed correctly. That's the, the distance. I said, you know, it's 100, but perhaps a bit more. Of course, obviously one word for this, but then there was some garbage, two more words uh, over there that we, uh, we found were there for. Uh, unknown reason, at least unknown to me. Anyway, so 112 is where 
I need to put in my malicious file, my bad file, I need to put this address of um, uh, this one, the beginning of the buffer. So my bad file simply should contain uh, offset zero, my payload. Offset uh, 112, this thing. And that's it. That should be my attack done. So now I've uh, um, figured out what to do at an intellectual level. I still need to do it. I need to write a binary file with this. And uh, if you don't know how to write a binary file with the content you want, then uh, uh, fear not, because I made a while ago a um, tutorial, which you can uh, go and have a look at on how to write a binary file. But otherwise, let's just uh, do something on the fly here. And let's see. Um, my payload was, um, so let's make an exploit. Where are we in here? We are still in the shared place, so we want to be in the uh, playground. That's bad. Okay, so let's now write um, exploit. exploit. Uh, it should be more like make exploit. Make exploit. So to make my exploit, uh, and I get rid of all this garbage, I um, offset zero, I put my payload, which was uh, payload shed, this thing. And then, um, so let's say this is uh, payload equals this string. Uh, then, um, I need some filler to get to uh, 112. So, uh, some junk character, let's say. Um, so, my um, bad file is going to be equal to uh, bytes. Bytes, can I make bytes out of payload? Maybe it's better if I make myself bad file equals a byte array of length. What's it going to be? 112 uh, is this plus 4 for that. It's going to be 116. I'm going to say um, 65, which is a capital letter A for I in range 116. I'm making myself uh, a byte array uh, f with 116 times the letter A inside, or the, the, byte, the byte 65. And I'm going to overwrite the initial part. Uh, if I'm going to make these into byte strings, I'm going to say bytes. Bytes this. And I'm going to say that the bad file from zero to length of payload is going to be the payload. Then the bad file at a position, uh, what was it, 112 to 112 plus 4 is going to be. Um, this uh, okay, so the absolute address of the payload uh, is going to be the absolute address of the buffer. 
this. Which I discovered by uh, checking it in GDB. And this is going to be uh, the address of the payload, which is a 32-bit word, two bytes, uh, four bytes with byte order equals little, because we are little India in here. Okay, and that uh, looks like everything we need. So now all that remains to be done is to uh, write it to the bat file uh, with uh, open. It's called bat file. Bat file for writing binary as f uh, f write bat file. All right, let's uh, uh, try that. If I um, if I run this make exploit, uh, now I've got this uh, bad file, which is 116 bytes. But if I have a look at it, uh, I can dump it. Uh, in, um, uh, I forgot the syntax of this stuff. Okay, so now we get this stuff, which is our machine code at the beginning, okay? Then plenty of A's, which is this uh, filler stuff that I have as a kind of background. And then uh, over here at position 112 uh, in decimal, I have my 0xFFF, uh, which is written, of course, in a little length, so FFFF D3, uh, D3 So that looks like what I wanted. And if I run the challenge, what do I see? I see that it doesn't work. And why does it not work? Uh, now, actually, I happen to know why it doesn't work. It doesn't work because I um, I hoped that um, I hoped that the debugger would give me the address uh, of the buffer, but actually, it gives me the address of the buffer while running under the debugger. And what happens? What happens is this: that um, when I run under the debugger, this is the memory, and uh, if this is like my initial state, then when I run the program, then there's going to be main, there's going to be whatever the other thing was, buff, and so on. When I run uh, under the debugger, the debugger itself will put some stuff on the stack before putting these. So there's going to be extra things in here, which are going to make um, so extra stuff put in by the debugger goes there. Uh, environment variables get pushed and all that stuff. And then my things, my program is here. So what used to be here is now here. And so I'm going to cheat and I'm going to uh, instrument my program just to demonstrate uh, what I'm talking about. I'm going to um, We got to instrument this program by printing where the buffer is. So print buffer equals now obviously if you're attacking a program uh, you can't do that because uh, if you well you may have the source because it's an open source program that you're attacking but you will not be able to 
recompile it and make it uh, root, make it owned by root and set your ID. Uh, otherwise, if you, you would already have the privileges that you're trying to escalate to. So I'm doing this purely for uh, pedagogical demonstration purposes. But if I now uh, recompile this thing, Recompile this and run it. Trace breakpoint trap. So this gives me this address, uh, which is not the same as this. Well, you might think, okay, well, that's because uh, you changed the program, so maybe that has affected. But if I now run this, uh, let's make another list. Uh, if I run this under the debugger, GDB uh, child uh, breakpoint in both and um, run. Okay. Um, print the buffer. Yeah, print me the buffer. And he printed uh, this, which is not the same. Right, so there's, a, there's an offset, there's a difference here uh, of 60 hex bytes for the fact that I'm running on the debugger. So, um, so that's why, and certainly that's the reason why it wouldn't work. On the other hand, now that I have this, um, this information here, I might as well keep on cheating and change my exploit to use that value. So instead of uh, instead of this, I can make it uh, d3cc. Uh, and if I now make the exploit, um, oh, make the exploit, uh, look at it, now contains the new value d3cc as the address which is where the program itself told me that the buffer starts and so this has a better chance of working but ah, i forgot that uh, to make things nice i should first um what was it might as well just read that sudo chemon root and then sudo chemon So our child is now a uh, set ID root, and if we run it, whoa, we got a root shell. Look at that. Isn't that cool? Okay. I got root by just typing the right uh, thing there. Now, of course, I'm cheating because uh, I, I mean, running the thing under the debugger is not. Not really cheating because you can always do that. I mean, if I if I am an unprivileged user and I'm given a set UID root program and I want to exploit it, then nobody stops me from running it under the debugger. I mean, the only thing is that I probably won't have the symbols compiled. It won't it won't have been compiled with minus G, so I would be a bit more blind in my exploration with the debugger. But I can still run it under the debugger. It will not be set UID root while it's under the debugger. Otherwise, I could do damage there. But I can still look at it inside there. I could, for example, figure out. Um, you know, the distance between uh, the bottom of the buffer and uh, the return address. I can figure that out uh, in, in GDB. That's all right. What I can't figure out in GDB is where uh, the buffer begins, because as we said, if it gives me a number, it's not going to be the real number outside GDB. Uh, and this number, I got it by making the program printed. And that uh, is cheating. Uh, that thing is cheating. Okay, that I, I should not... Um, I should not expect to be able to do. I will not be able to do. So I must find a way to um, carry out this type of attack even when um, I cannot instrument my program to tell me where the buffer begins. So what am I going to do? 
Well, um, the point is that I should have some kind of idea where the buffer begins, because it's not going to be um, not going to be completely random. It, we've disabled the uh, ASLR, so the, the stack always starts in the same place. So I can have a program with minimum uh, minimum content, like a, a hello world, a hello world that prints out uh, where uh, its local variables are. That's a good approximation to the highest that the stack can be, because when, when the stack is shortest, then over there, what is this hello world? I, I, I prepared one earlier. Uh, hello. Of course, it's not that it's in it's in the shared. Um, shared buffer overflow. Uh, hello. Okay, there it is. This is just a hello world. It makes a local variable and prints out uh, its address. So if I run this thing and it gives me this address, then um, that's a, a, a good good hint as to uh, what the uh, max value for the stack is, or more or less. And then, uh, unless I have a program with uh, lots of recursion, then the stack is not going to be uh, that many stack frames deep. And if I if I have some clue about the size of a stack frame, I more or less know uh, where to search. So. With that, I can estimate some range for where a range of valid addresses or a range of possible addresses where my buffer could start. I could try them one by one. I mean, I could just uh, brute force. I'd have to rewrite my bad file every time because every time this this part of the bad file needs to be rewritten, even if the rest stays the same. Then every time I rewrite the bad file and I write, then I try to do the next address, rewrite this. Right, next address and right. Uh, and at some point, uh, hopefully, I would hit uh, the right value. Now, that's possible, but tedious. And it's okay when I'm attacking a local program. It's not okay when I'm attacking a remote program, because there, if I try every possible address in a range that may be uh, several k or several tens of k long, then uh, the remote administrators would uh, most likely notice that uh, someone's running and crashing a program for uh, tens of thousands of times and they would say something suspicious going on and that's not a good thing when you're carrying out an attack to bring attention to yourself because they will notice and they will shut things down and they will harden the system and it's uh, the the better attacker is the one that uh, goes there in stealth and nobody notices that they're there and that they can continue accessing the system uh, for longer, while it's still uh, weak and, and vulnerable and exploitable. So, uh, what I want to do is to uh, make a bad file that will work for um, not just one uh, correct guess of, of, the, of where the address is, but it, it would work for um, many addresses in one go. And so, how do I do that? Well. I'm making a file. This is my uh, my bad file. Okay, bad file. And my bad file has at some precise offset. In my case, 112. In here, it has the return address that I want to overwrite. Uh, now. Depending on where this thing is, the start of this, uh, this uh, key buffer, depending on where this is, uh, I may want to rewrite it uh, with a different value in here. But this distance, at least, I'm sure of, because I know the, sh the shape of the stack frame. So this, is not, this distance is not going to change. This value is going to change depending on where this is. Now, is there a way 
that I could write in here a value that would be uh, correct for more than one initial value of the buffer. And there's an ingenious way of doing that. And this is, uh, there's an instruction in machine code, which is called no operation. So if you encounter this no operation instruction, what you do is just do nothing and move to the next instruction. So you can make uh, what is known as a knob sled uh, by entering various knobs in here. Okay, so knob, knob, knob. This is actually a one byte instruction. So if, if these slices are words, this will be knob, 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 knob. And then I put the payload that initially I was putting at the beginning of the buffer. Here I put it after a sled of knobs. Okay, so this is my payload. So then this means that any address I hit in here will eventually take me to the payload. If I enter this code here, then it's like before. I execute the payload. If I enter the code here, I execute nop, 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 and then the payload. If I enter the code here, I execute nop, 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 and then the payload. And every address in this nop sled is just as good as the actual first byte of the payload. And so if my nop sled is, for example, uh, 32 bytes long, then uh, this uh, bad file works for 33 addresses, the 32 of the knobs plus the one of, of the payload. And if I want, if I if I manage to make my thing, um, and I, I can make it up to uh, 112 almost, perhaps, uh, I can stick this to the edge of that, with my payload, and then uh, put uh, as much, as many knobs as fit, which would be a bit less than 100. Uh, you would find it. It's actually not a good idea to just uh, butt this against the return address because uh, undesirable uh, things might happen if uh, there is, uh, for some reason, uh, some uh, extra uh, activity on the stack before hitting the return, for example. Uh, part of your routine might be overwritten by pushes on the stack. So anyway, don't, don't put it just there. But you're still bounded by, by this distance. If you put it over here, then you can make a much longer sled. You could make a, uh, I mean, in, in this case, in the case of this program, the bad file is, is bounded. It cannot be longer than 600 uh, bytes overall. But if I stick my uh, knob sled and payload uh, above the return address instead of below, then I can make the knob sled much longer. So I have uh, a little less than 500 bytes to play with. So what I would do, my new exploit, uh, let's bring this back. Uh, where are we? Make exploit. Make exploit. Uh, and I'm going to say make exploit 2. Okay, make exploit 2. It's going to be uh, address of the buffer, absolute address of the buffer is going to be uh, a buffer min equals some value. Uh, this is. Let's say I start at uh, uh, 300, start looking. Uh, this thing said D6AC was the, 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 the top that I was looking at. This is D3. Well, I, I'm not really supposed to know anything about what, what this value was. Let's say that I start at D000, whatever. Then uh, A address of the payload is not going to be A address of the buffer. It's going to be... Uh, it's going to be after, after the um, the return address. So the relative address of the return address. So the offset of return is going to be the 112 that I found earlier. Then the offset of my payload is going to be uh, just after that 112 plus four, uh, one word of four bytes. And then the absolute address of the payload. Well, I don't really know because I don't know the absolute address of my buffer. This is just a minimum value. And then there's going to be a maximum value. And it's going to range between those. But it's going to be, uh, let me just write it as a comment as opposed to a Python instruction. It's going to be uh, the address of the buffer uh, plus um, our payload. Okay. 
well, the address to buffer in, in, in this uh, notation I've been using here would be A of buffer, but I don't know that value. It, it, it's going to range between A buffer min and A buffer max. And uh, so how does this how does this work? I have to understand this. This is the crucial crucial part of this, this, this clever bit. This is my memory over here. And my guess is that, okay, that's the range where I expect to find uh, where I expect to find uh, the beginning of the buffer. It could be anywhere in here. I'm from from having looked at the, the, you know, the hello world and so on. That's going to be quite a range. Now my bad file it may not be able to span all that range, uh, but my bad file is going to be something like this. And my bad file is going to have this return address here, and then here is going to have an op sled. Nop sled. And then at the end of that it's gonna have a payload. And basically any of these are good as entry points into my code. If I hit anywhere in here, then I'm going to be good for executing the payload. Right, so now what happens when I ooh, what happens when I put this thing uh, in, in memory. So I said that the start of, um, of the buffer could happen anywhere between here and here. So this means that this can be positioned here, or 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 can be positioned anywhere up to here, because this is the range of possible uh, values for the address of the start of the buffer. So when the start of the buffer is here, it's going to happen here. And so all these values, all these addresses, are good entry points for executing my payload. Now, when this is here, then all these addresses are good for executing my payload. Okay, but the question that we still haven't answered is, is what should I write in this place? Because I have to write one number, right? I cannot write a, a variable uh, address in here. I have to write a number. This is compiled into um, a sequence of bytes that I then have to send. So look at this. This is the crucial point. If I'm here, then any of these addresses here work. If I'm here, it's a, a different range. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to move the red screen. Um, as I move this, what happens? Is there an address that works for uh, triggering my payload in all of these cases? I want an address that always works whether the beginning of my, my knob sled is at the bottom of the red squiggle or anywhere in the red squiggle or the top of the red squiggle. Now, obviously I can't have any more range than the length of my knob sled, that's obvious, but I want something that will work in all these cases and that something is, with a moment's thought, this, uh, which is the address of the payload itself when uh, when my um, my buffer is in the lowest position because in here it just runs the payload itself without doing any knobs and in the extreme position up here it runs through uh, the whole knob sled and then it runs my payload and anything that's intermediate then if I hit uh, this address then it runs a bit of the knob sled and then my payload so that is the optimal, optimal thing that I can do. If I assume that my, uh, my bad file is positioned in the lowest place where it could be, then the address I should put in here is the address where my payload is. And then if it really is in that position, then um, no part of the knob sled will be executed. And the further up it is, uh, more of the knob sled will be run if I hit that point before going to the payload. 
and my extreme of that range is over here where uh, I run through the whole knob sled before doing the payload. So, with that understood, uh, what I'm doing here is if this is the minimum position of the buffer, then offset of the payload um, is not going to be that uh, 102 plus 4. This is going to be the offset of the knob sled. And then um, my uh, so the offset of the payload is going to be from what I said I want to put the, my payload as high up as it can so um, let's say uh, the length of the bad file is bounded by this constraints to 600 uh, the fact that uh, the, the challenge program takes at most uh, 600 Where is it? it won't read any more than 600 bytes so I, I can't make it any bigger than that so uh, the place where I'm going to put the payload is going to be length of the bad file minus uh, length of the payload so that it is just there uh, as high up as it can go and then the place between O knob sled and O payload is going to be full of knobs and in fact what I can do is this bad file was I was just filling it up with A's to begin with I can fill it with knobs and knob is um, uh, 90 hex over here and uh, then my address of the payload is going to be yeah it's going to vary with the address of the buffer but what I said is the address that I'm going to uh, jump to so uh, jump to the thing I want to override the return address with is going to be a buffer min plus offset of the payload right so uh, this one should be instead offset of the payload to offset of the payload plus length of the payload a equals payload yeah that's right a bad file 112 that stays in the same position uh, address of the pay no this is a jump to convert it into bytes like that okay so now that looks uh, like what well, the thing we were uh, drawing over there so I have a bad file of 600 bytes as long as I can because the longer it is the longer my knob sled uh, it starts here and I may have to redo this for various other uh, values now how long is my knob sled uh, I can even write it out uh, No length length no sled equals uh, or offset of the payload minus offset of the no sled and then no sled length of the top sled equals uh, length of the no sled. So, um, and I can say, um, print um, this uh, bad file uh, works if the uh, start address of the buffer is included in uh, a buffer main actually you want to write it in hex to uh, 
and that same stuff plus the length of the knob slide, knob slide. Ah, that's disgusting. Uh. Okay. Right. Uh, if the knob sled is one knob long, then this is um, yeah. So bo both of these included is going to be uh, both ends included I, I could just say put these brackets around it to make it clear that that's what I mean so if I have an obsolete of length 1 there's two valid addresses the obsolete and the original one if I have an obsolete of length 10 then 11 valid addresses the 10 knobs are all good plus the original starting point anyway so the length of an obsolete plus 1 is the number of addresses I can deal with with my near um, bad file. So let's see. Make exploit two. Okay, works if uh, the address of the buffer is in D zero 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 D one C nine, which we know is not the case uh, because the um, what was it called? Uh, Chow conveniently tells us we're not supposed to know, but it tells us that it's in uh, D3CC, so it didn't work, of course. And so then I change, uh, I change, I increment this uh, to restart from here. Um, D1C9. And this uh, gives me something uh, up to D392, which, look at that, it's actually, um, where did it say it was? Um, D3CC, that's just over that, so it still won't work. All right, then I try again, uh, D392. Of course, uh, for things bigger than that, you, you would write a loop to do that. Uh, not by hand. So now this should work for a buffer between these two boundaries, which include uh, D3CC. So I expect this now to work. Whoa, didn't work. Uh, now I'm quite disappointed. So why does this not work? Let's have a look uh, with, uh, let's have a look at the file I produced. So this bad file doesn't look like it's long enough because it should be 600 bytes. It's only 143 bytes, so something's wrong. Uh, something's wrong, what's wrong? What's wrong is that uh, this byte array here uh, is still in range 116, and I should have said in range uh, length of the bad file. Let's try again, okay. Now it's in this range. Okay, I should have restarted from the beginning of the range, but let's not uh, waste so much time. Uh, uh, oh, I, yes. Um, okay, let's try our challenge. Aha! Now I got root. Great! Okay. So, we, uh, we have found a way to um, carry out our attack even if we don't know by cheating the exact starting address. I could I demonstrated that I could start from um, any plausible address and then uh, search the space in a rather more efficient way because I was checking 457 positions every time instead of one position every time. So I, I sped myself up by a factor of 457 by using the knob sled. Now there's still one problem which is that this is fine if I have control over the uh, executable in the sense that I'm an unprivileged user on a uh, system where this 
uh, executable is accessible, I can uh, I can see that uh, there's this child to which I have execute rights, uh, and if I uh, execute, it will execute as a root, and I just want to let it execute some of my own code as root. But I can already uh, run this thing as many times as I want. I can put it under debugger and so on. Sometimes you want to exploit a buffer overflow in something that is not under your control to this extent, it's something that's the other side of the network. Some program is accepting input over the network, and you want to feed it input that will make you run your code on the remote system with the privileges of the program that's accepting the input. But you can't run the debugger on it to see what the, um, the shape of the stack frame is. So in that sense, you have two things to guess. If we go back to our uh, picture over here, then uh, we had the uncertainty about where this thing was going to be located in memory. So what's going to be the uh, start address of the buffer, which determines what number I have to write in here. But now we have another uncertainty, which is where do I write this number? Because I don't know for sure what the offset is between this return address and the start of the buffer. And if I don't know where to write this, then, but I have some hunch because I kind of figure out uh, what the buffer size would might be like, and I, I have some, some ideas about this, the stack frame that I'm attacking. Then the thing to do is once I've computed an address using the method that we just described about um, doing something that is at the top of the knob sled, then what I do is I actually uh, rewrite this value that I found in many other places, many other adjacent places. This is called spraying. I'm spraying the stack with the address I want to jump to in the hope that at least one of these is going to be hitting the uh, actual return address on the stack. Of course, they're all word aligned, so all these things are on, on boundaries of uh, four byte aligned. And uh, yeah, and, and then I proceed in the same way as before. And the rest is going to be my knob sled, still knob sled over here. And finally, my payload. I mean, it doesn't have to be in that order. The order of these sections can change. You can still have the payload first if you want. Knob slide before it. And uh, your spray, the return uh, address is to be overwritten after that, which of course would be uh, pointing backwards. And so that's how you deal with when you have to guess that uh, thing that for us was the 112. In here, instead of sticking uh, the return at a specific offset, you would uh, poke it in, uh, in a multitude of locations. And um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to demonstrate this uh, by writing a program, but you will be doing that uh, in as part of your uh, of your seed labs that's it for today i hope you found this helpful if you did like subscribe and i'll be thrilled if you leave a comment mentioning radiators to let me know that you got all the way to here all the other videos for my security course are available from this playlist thank you for watching and i'll see you in the next video